We're going to start off, we've uh, kind of made it a tradition to uh, start this show with Paul McLean telling us about what he expects to see at NAB, what's new, what's awesome, and what's amazing. And look, he's already here and prepared. I even have a clicker. I don't promise nobody will be injured in the process of this presentation, but we'll try. Thanks, Thank Paul. <laughs> Good morning. Let's see if I can. Yes, excellent. Thank you. Before I begin speaking, can I just say the people that organized this event really deserve a round of applause for the years of doing it successfully. Well done, Nautel. It's a real pleasure to be invited back, and apparently enough of you checked, yeah, he was okay on the scorecard for me to be invited back, so I appreciate that. I started off last year talking about AI, and while I don't like to repeat myself, the things that are happening in that space with generative AI are truly important. Daniel Ann Standig was the guy who woke everybody up last year by introducing Radio GPT, and this year he's been promoted to the keynote session that's uh, Monday, where he'll share the stage with a humanoid robot. He plans to discuss data findings about how audiences perceive AI. He shared a few video clips with me, and here, this is about 40 seconds. Hi, I'm Daniel, and this is Amica. Uh -oh. We hope you come to see us at NAB on April 15th at 9.30, when we do the world's first keynote co-presented by a human and a humanoid robot. Futuri did a research study of 5,200 consumers of media. Cut, cut. Cut. I really need to know my motivation here. Like will they know that's the largest study ever done on AI in media? Ever yeah. done on AI what? in media? Ever done on AI in media? Are you okay? Sorry. I'm by the magnitude of this data. Daniel's been uh, with Amica for a few days, and I was just chatting with Craig uh, from Futuri, who told me that it's pretty remarkable, um, the interactions that can happen. So I'll be looking forward to that. Quite a few radio stations now are using AI hosts with synthetic voices, typically overnight. But is generative AI good enough to co-host a program with its instant give and take? We'll find out. Futuri is rolling out co-host AI, a tool that facilitates interactions between human hosts and AI personalities. Futuri doesn't have a booth at the show. You can go to the session or contact them via their website to connect. And I know Craig is here. I don't know of any AI co-hosts on the air just yet, co-hosts. This uh, next picture is of uh, AI Tori. She's the overnight host of an NRG media station in Iowa, which uses the Futuri technology. I say she, that's a fake image and a fake host. Our publisher, John Casey, who's here, says, why are these AI images always so dystopian? And I say, maybe they're trying to tell us something. Other companies with AI presence at the show, Radio Cloud, Enco, Super Hi-Fi, Waymark, and Veritone are a few of them. Their products are doing everything from creating instant spec commercials for salespeople out in the field on site with clients, drafting marketing emails, generating video ads on the spot, identifying prospects for your sales team, and writing computer code. It is pretty amazing what's out there. But what about the question of audience perceptions? Well, three quarters of core listeners say they have serious concerns about AI replacing radio hosts. That's according to the Jacobs Media Tech Survey that comes out this week. They asked listeners how they would feel about stations using artificial voices to read commercials or to read station IDs or to take the place of live personalities. <clears throat> Pardon me. And what Jacobs found was that using AI in place of live talent is a deal breaker for most active listeners. That's the top red chart there, top red bar in the chart. And the key phrase is major concerns. Now this might change over time. I mean, obviously there's a lot of concern in general in our community, uh, in our culture about AI. Um, but as Fred Jacobs puts it, radio needs to start with the question. How can we use AI to create a better experience for our customers? And unfortunately, radio sometimes falls down on that using new tech to cut costs and cut headcount instead. So beware. Radio World has talked about this in a recent ebook that I put together uh, on artificial intelligence, and I hope you'll check it out. I learned a great deal uh, researching this one. It's at radioworld.com slash ebooks. <coughs> Pardon me. Now, why is this boring chart on the screen? I was blown away when I looked at the in-vehicle visuals report that was released by Q 
this week. That's the company that creates synchronized radio ads for card displays. Q sent a researcher out to sit in the top 100 selling vehicles, new vehicles in the United States, and gathered information about what was on the dashboard. What radio services did it have? Radio AM, FM, Sirius, etc. Is there a dedicated radio button? Does it support PS data and radio text? Does it display HD title and artist and album art? And then they put together a web page that lists those findings for each new make and model of the top selling 100 vehicles. I was stunned by this collection and he took pictures of every single one of those 100 vehicles. None of us has the time to go sit in hundreds of cars. None of us has an appreciation of the variety of displays of how our stations show up with the one possible exception of David Lair, who's in this room. But on this site, you can see how RDS and HD metadata would display, not on a random dashboard, on all of the dashboards of the top 100 selling new vehicles in the country. It's pretty amazing. <coughs> Excuse me. And they published some findings that I think are important. Two out of three new cars sold in the United States now has HD radio. And we've been following that story for a long time. There have been plenty of cynics about it over the years, but that's a huge number, especially if your station isn't broadcasting in HD radio and everybody else around you is. However, General Motors is a major exception. GM only supports HD in a few Cadillacs, and they sell a lot of cars in the United States. Q also found there's a growing number of cars that let you access sources like Alexa and Apple Music directly from the dash without a phone involved. That's the next new important trend. And they already found that 20% of those new cars allowed you to do that. It all reinforces your in-dash experience is vital. So check out the Q website. The company's called, uh, spelled Q-U-U. -U. Very interested to see how the uh, community of suppliers of technology responds to this. The FCC is going to allow FC, uh, FM geo targeting after years of the discussion about it. This uh, past few weeks, it gave unanimous approval to the concept of allowing FM stations to originate programming on boosters for three minutes an hour. Boosters traditionally have not been allowed to s generate their own or unique content. So stations can target a weather forecast to a sliver of a footprint of the signal or a traffic report or more to the point, commercials. Sell commercials specifically to little subsectors of your broadcast footprint. The FCC has not finalized the rules. For now, it will allow existing boosters to originate programming under one-year experimental authorizations that can be renewed. The NAB and a number of radio groups have been fighting this vociferously and are continuing to fight it. They're afraid not only of interference, but of listener confusion and the impact of driving ad rates down. But it's a big win for geo broadcast solutions, which makes the zone casting system that many people will know about that uses synchronized boosters and antennas to overlay these geographically localized signals in the target regions. Some people think this is going to revolutionize FM. Some people think it's going to be a disaster. I personally think it's probably going to end up taking its place in the toolkit of spectrum tools, just like translators for AM and HD translator plays did. But we will see. An engineering session tomorrow puts the spotlight on EAS partial county alerting. Broadcast signals, of course, don't stop at county lines. PCA works by dividing a county into subdivisions or partitions, and you, the broadcaster, choose which partitions apply to your area, and then you program that information into your EAS gear. The idea is to increase the credibility of weather activations. The audience won't hear uh, warnings that don't apply to them. Relevant right here in Las Vegas because PCA is used in Clark County, Nevada. And Adrian Abbott of the Nevada SECC will join officials from NOAA and the National Weather Service to talk about uh, how it has benefited them. And that image there on screen is from a, a website particularly about Clark County. The FCC used to publish self-inspection checklists. Remember those? It stopped updating them about 14 years ago. Notably, you can probably still find the, I know you can still find the information online, which is a recipe for confusion, but many rules have changed since then. At this show, the SBE and the NAB will release their own fresh guidelines for FM and TV stations at f to start. Um, these are not official documents. They're not involved with the FCC at this point, but they most certainly will help you stay in compliance. If you're interested, there's a discussion about it. This is Tuesday. It's in the Connect Zone Theater out on the exhibit hall of the west, uh, exhibit floor of the West Hall 
Uh, oh, that's Blake Thompson. We did a recent story about the alternative broadcast inspection program. <coughs> Pardon me. Turning to our technology supplier community, three familiar names are merging into one company. Max Connect, Angry Audio, and Logitech have combined just this week to form Triple Helix Technologies. They will make an intriguing combination. This new company has brands like Max Connect Wireless, Studio Hub, Chameleon Processors, MK Technical Services, and Logitech AOIP consoles. Triple Helix is positioning itself to provide services and products that offer major market performance on small market budgets. It's an intriguing combination of entrepreneurs as well. Josh Bone of Max Connect becomes CEO, Mike Dosh of Angry Audio heads product development, and Tag Borland of Logitech heads technology. These guys individually have contributed a lot to our industry and our technology supplier community. They're also very entrepreneurial individuals, so I am interested to see how it will all work out. Max Connect and Logitech have booths at the show, um, and Angry Audio is in a dealer booth. On the RF side, Dielectric has a new FM antenna, the DCRE. This fills a gap between its lowest power DCRT model and its higher power ring antennas. This is for stations that need input power ratings up to 4 kilowatts per bay. The E model can stack with up to 12 bays, and each bay weighs only 18 pounds. You can have center or end-fed end configurations, and the ray domes are optional. I was just very tickled that PowerPoint actually had a little animation of a drone, so I had to stick it in there. Also in the world of RF, ERI will introduce a new FM bandpass filter, the 940 series. It's a compact model with an unusual form factor. The company says it's the smallest available footprint FM bandpass filter capable of handling five kilowatts average power. It has a four section single cabinet design and the footprint is less than 18 by 21 inches. It's uh, rated to handle up to three kilowatts at the output with convection cooling, or, but five with forced air cooling. Datacom offers an ecosystem of remote site management products and new to its product is Neuro. This is a rackable box that allows you to mix and match general purpose I.O. boards to give you the input output count you need. It occupies one rack unit, just three inches deep. Your boards go into five slots in the chassis. And there's a board with eight analog inputs, another with eight digital inputs, one for five relay outputs, and the neuro can be configured with various combinations. The system does quite a bit more than I have time to talk about, so swing by Datacom if that intrigues you. Super Hi-Fi is doing some interesting things, and one that's a little eyebrow raising is it made a joint announcement with Orban of an addition to the Optimod product line. This is the Optimod 5950, previously introduced, but this is the Super Hi-Fi edition. They call this an all-in-one transmitter-based cloud playout appliance. It combines Orban processing and Super Hi-Fi's uh, hi AI programming, and it incorporates HLS Plus. So if you've been watching the news, this is a streaming technology that Super Hi-Fi recently introduced, and Odyssey is using it on 700 online stations. HLS Plus lets stations deliver your broadcasts and metadata over the air, but at the same time, send interactive personalized versions of these to apps and to smart speakers. So there's a lot happening in one box here and a lot to follow. You've heard me talk about DTS AutoStage, the entertainment platform from Xperi that combines over-the-air broadcast linear with IP content. It was developed with radio and audio as its anchor, but now it has evolved to include video, video in cars. I know, I know, I know, video in cars, not a good match. Through what the company is calling the DTS Auto Stage Video Service Powered by TiVo. TiVo, part of Xperia, as you probably know. Xperia says there's increasing appetite and demand for video entertainment in the car. The system delivers personalized recommendations by a combination of machine learning, big data and human curation, much as the audio version does. BMW has already rolled this out in its five series vehicles and there are more coming. Xperia is also becoming active in gaming in the car off of this platform, so keep an eye on what they are doing with DTS AutoStage. Also on the floor, Wheatstone is highlighting its system link, its FM MPX over IP transporter, Wheatstone has added RIST, R-I-S-T, Reliable Internet Stream Transport Connectivity. With this, System Link can transport the FM MPX plus 
HD or DAB signal at low latency across IP links of any capacity. It can do this uncompressed or using an optional micro MPX system, uh, it's codec, excuse me, <clears throat> system links available for Wheatstone's audio processors. It's also compatible with existing STLs and audio processors. Innovonics has been on a roll with new products in the last year and it had a big immediate hit with this when it started shipping over the winter. This is the 677 Triple Tuner, an EAS monitor receiver in a half rack package that gives you three built-in frequency agile receivers, each programmable for AM, FM, and NOAA reception. Each has a balanced monaural XLR audio output to serve as an EAS monitor or an off-air monitor for your facility. It's a little box, but it has a lot of useful screens. Here you can see the home screen with the three tuner displays. Another longtime friend of the industry is Comrex. They're debuting a major feature update for their Gaggle remote contribution service. You probably remember a couple years ago they introduced Gaggle, which enables you to send and receive audio through a web browser to a Comrex hardware IP codec and supports up to five remote uh, participants. New this year is Hotline. The company says it makes a dramatic improvement in the quality of the cell call for on-air use. What happens is that Gaggle with Hotline provides a 10-digit phone number for your guest or your reporter to call from their cell phone. The audio is presented within the interface in HD voice quality to put on the air. Um, they're also, by the way, adding a product called the Gaggle Solo, a free offering for a single guest to connect to a studio. And then it just remains for me to note that NAB will honor Dave Colasar at the show, as you probably know. Let's hear a hand for Dave. Many of us here in the room know him and, of course, have worked with him in one way or another. Uh, he's the engineer for Hubbard Radio, who flipped an AM station in Maryland to all digital mode of HD radio. NAB uses the term broadcast engineering a pioneer. It said that in addition to his efforts to make all digital AM a reality, he's been an advocate for it in the industry, and he certainly has, documenting it to all sorts of presentations and sessions at the NAB show and elsewhere. I'm also very quietly proud of Dave because he was the recipient of our Radio World Engineering, Ex uh, Engineering Excellence Award four years ago. Uh, he certainly deserves it. Now, to conclude, you may recall that I've been trying for years to get my wife to let me buy a t-shirt Gatling gun. I am sorry, the factory tells me it's on back order because of parts shortages. So I've had to go for older technology this year, but old is good. Here we have the specially adapted Great British Railway T-shirt gun from World War I. However, not tell being Canadian and myself half Canadian, I had to correct that on the screen. These shirts are only available at the NUG during NAV. I promise not to try to knock over someone's coffee. Apparently, I did that last year and I very much apologize to that person, especially if you're still recovering with second degree burns. And drone delivery is available, but not really. All right, let's give this a try in the back of the room. Did I spill it? Let's feel. Thank you.